in six minutes, some very familiar faces to mark 64 years of the BBC from the days when you were advised to twist the cat's whisker. Until then, a flight of fancy of birds of a feather.
Now on to Tom O'Connor meets the stars and tells the story of how broadcasting moved north in a twist of the cat's whisker. Music through the air. A miracle. Well, 64 years ago, it was a miracle. Because that's when England heard its first public wireless broadcast. And the man on the street could take his 10-bob note, go down the road, and buy himself a magic box. And where would he buy it? Well, a chemist, of course. Imagine that. A packet of aspirins and a wireless, please. And this is what he'd get. A crystal set. So it's on with the earphones. Twist the cat's whisker. That's what they call a wire rubbing against the crystal. And you were tuned to music from the sky. All this happened in 1922, and that was the year they discovered Tutankhamun's tomb. Not a lot of people know that. Not very glamorous, but this was once one of the biggest industrial estates in Europe. Trafford Park, a couple of miles outside the centre of Manchester. We're getting very near now to the very first British broadcasting studio outside of London. Radio waves used to travel through Earth thick with smoke and grime. Not that they'd notice that. The smoke's all gone now, but the studio hasn't. It's in here. This used to be the research department of a firm called Metropolitan Vickers. So 64 years ago, the North heard its first wireless programs from a tiny studio down this corridor. This was Manchester radio station 2ZY. You could just about swing a cat round by its whiskers. Mind you, it was even smaller than this because they had to hang drapes to deaden the sound. Now, Metrovix had been experimenting for months with wireless from here, but to officially broadcast, they had to join the British Broadcasting Company, which was the only body that was in charge. Now, you see, that's what the Americans were lacking, control. They did manage to cram a few musicians in here, you know, and they had a tiny 2ZY orchestra, but no drums. But that didn't bother them. They used a tea chest and a hammer covered in dusters. Did they have yellow dusters then? That tower held one end of the transmitter aerial. It's gone now. Knocked it down, they did. Well, it was too helpful as a landmark, you see, for the Luftwaffe. This is where it stood. Now, the fellow behind this great wireless experiment was a chap called Arthur Fleming. He was head of research here at Metrovix Manchester Works. Now, Arthur, being a sensible sort of chap, bought himself a house on the windward side of the Trafford Park smoke. Fairly posh area, actually, called Hale. Not that this was just any old suburban villa, because strange things were going on six miles from this industrial estate in the Roaring Twenties. This is it, the stockbroker and head of Metrovix research department belt. Fleming's house was just up the road. Wonder how many residents of respectable Hale knew what went on behind the curtains of High Clare. A very impressive detached house it was. And still is. It's still here. Now up there, Fleming crammed a room full of electronic equipment and High Clare was a vital part of the northern broadcasting operation. Surprise, a living room. There's one in every suburb. Even I've got one. But in 1922, it looked like this. And here's where Fleming used to sit night after night to monitor the output of station 2ZY. First sign of trouble, he'd be on the phone. Hello, Fleming here. That violin sounds like you're castrating a cat. Move the mic. Another piece of history was made in this house. The first radio signals from station KDKA Pittsburgh were actually picked up on that frame aerial. And they were sent by landline to be transmitted from station 2ZY six miles over there. 
And that's how England heard its first American broadcast. And the year was 1923. And funny enough, in that year, you could have got four million million German marks for a dollar, if it wanted to. Would you believe, after hail, we've got rain. Anyway, after a year in Trafford Park, our brave pioneers packed up and moved down to the city centre. They stayed briefly in a cotton warehouse and then they brought their valves and mics down by the riverside. The Irwell wends its murky way through the city centre and here it passes a road called the Parsonage and that's where our broadcasters set up shop in 1924. The building's gone now. Do you know there used to be terrace gardens here that ran down to sparkling water but the Industrial Revolution changed all that. They even chucked buckets of eau de cologne in here when Queen Victoria took a barge down the airwell. It's worn off a bit since. No, there were no teas on the terraces for the staff of the infant BBC. A couple of points about the Riverside Studios. The staff lived in fear of flooding because the studios were three storeys down there. And the airwell used to rise to within a couple of feet of the window from time to time, so it wasn't the place to be on stormy days. Also, in the studio waiting room, there was a sign, and the sign actually said, audiences are requested not to clap after items. A bit worrying if you're an artist and you haven't seen the sign. Imagine it. I did it my way. Nothing. In 1929, the radio chaps left the Murky River and moved even nearer to the city centre. The BBC was growing up and the sea now stood for corporation. They moved into even more spacious surroundings in that building over there. That was 1929. Now, I've been giving you, not a lot of people know that, information on various years. Well, in 1929, not a lot happened. One of the sound studios in there was quite large, big enough, in fact, to take a reasonably sized orchestra. So the BBC disbanded the one they had and formed, yes, a smaller one, only nine players. But by the outbreak of war, the BBC Northern Orchestra had grown again, and in 1944, they appointed their first principal conductor, a very young Charles Groves. This was once part of Studio One. It's an empty office now, but Sir Charles Groves is back 42 years after he first conducted the BBC Northern Orchestra. Well, I remember, the, the greatest thing I remember is meeting my wife, who worked here. And uh, the next thing I remember is the wonderful uh, camaraderie there was in the BBC then. It was a small thing, and, and we were all very great friends, I think. The third thing I remember, how awful the studio was, this studio. I mean, even in a, a Haydn symphony, a comparatively small orchestra, you get a terrible lag from the back of the orchestra with the trumpets and drums because the sound was all round everyone, and it was, it was quite difficult to work. When we went to the Milton Hall in Deansgate, we were as, uh, as pleased as a dog with four tails. <laughs> Everything was live. Yeah. And I prefer it, in a way, because you, you've got the red light on and you've got to get it all in in one. Now this question of pre-recording, it isn't the same as a commercial recording, because you can't just go on and on till you get it right. You've, it's limited to time. So it's neither one thing nor the other. I like the red light going on and, and give a concert. This was once the Broadcasting House newsroom. All gone. All that's left of this bit now are dirty offices and empty corridors where the great names used to walk to punish themselves drinking BBC coffee. Names like Wilfred Pickles, Violet Carson, Norman Evans and a surprise to me, someone who went on to become a household name in radio because in 1937 
Northern BBC appointed as their new press officer a young man who was to become the first palace correspondent and war correspondent. A young man called Talbot. Godfrey Talbot. Ah, oh, welcome back, press officer Talbot. Tell me, what, what exactly was your job here half a century ago? I was a writer, a journalist, a public relations officer, and my job was to sell, to publicise the marvellous programmes that were coming out of North Region. These were vintage days here. London was still boiled shirt and scripts, but Manchester was showing the way, and I was delighted to be writing about it. They didn't know I could talk in those days. They were putting on here, in this place, in these studios, real people, ordinary people, talking naturally from the mills, from the moors, crowds of them coming in, feature programmes. There was one night, I remember, from the bus queue outside, one chap got swept in with all the bands and the choirs and the mill folk and everything. I remember young Wilfred Pickles talking to this chap just before we went on the air, and he said, now, what, what, what are you? Which, are, are, you are, are you the band? Are, are you from, from Rochdale? And he said, no, I'm not that chap. Well, he said, what, what do you do? What are you doing in the show? I can't remember. He said, well, nothing. I was standing in the bus queue, and I came in here, and I feel quite at home. I've always wanted to see this place, and, you know, you're very good. And he, well, Wilfred said, what have you been doing? He said, oh, I've been singing with band. The library was in here, but in 1959, out went the files and books, and in went two television cameras. A local nightly magazine programme was mounted in the 60s, and it brought to our screens a now familiar face. Several acres of land will be converted into a linear park, and finally the weather forecast, it's wet, and it's going to get wetter. And that's it for tonight. Look North back again on your screens, same time tomorrow. Till then, as usual, I bid you a fond farewell. What the hell are you lot doing in here? <coughs> Telly Studio's gone, but it was here. Stuart, what was it like? Well, Tom, when you were in Knickerbockers in 1926 and I first joined television, it was all live in those days. Everything happened live. And in this little studio here, I remember Dorothy Shirley, the Olympic high jumper, attempting the world indoor high jump record. She leapt so high, she leapt over the cameras and finished in a heap with a broken arm by this door over here. And then we had the Georgian State Ballet and fighting with swords, about 30 guys. Can you imagine? <laughs> A lot of steam in the kitchen in those days. And it, as I say, it was all live. And we had a guy called Norman Langley, a floor manager. He's now head of paperclips in Northern Ireland. The archetypal floor manager. And we'd run out of things to say. The film had gone down, the guests had departed, and we were left with ten minutes of airtime to fill. I'm looking at Norman, and he's looking at me, and suddenly he colours up bright beetroot red. This archetypal floor manager turns his back on me and shrugs his bloody shoulders. <laughs> so I read the fat stock prices in Latin, a few old gags, and launched into something, went through the weather, and out into the national news. But the funniest thing is, you know, that uh, in 1966, the Daily Express had a uh, television poll, a personality poll. I came first, Tom Jones came second, and Roger Moore came third. Now, whatever happened to those two other guys? Right. They were great days. <laughs> the advent of television, exciting, adrenaline-flowing days. Wonderful. Broadcasting House was OK for radio, but too small for variety shows with an audience, and so they bought that theatre. It was 1955. That was the year ITV started. And wait for it, it was the year the Velcro fastener was patented. Now, not a lot of people... Never mind. The Playhouse closed just a few months ago, and nobody knows what will happen to it, so this could be our last chance to see inside the BBC's radio theatre. They had a party on that last night, and the theatre was filled with guests who'd come to say goodbye. Members of what used to be the BBC Northern Variety Orchestra played, and Alan Ainsworth conducted. The audience struggled with a sing-along led by 
Les Dawson. So the Playhouse was able to mount big radio shows, but television still needed a studio. And in the year the BBC bought the radio theatre, do you remember that was 1955, the year Velcro came out? Sorry. They also found a home for television, a church. And that's where we meet stars who broadcast to the country from Manchester. Now... <laughs> Matthew Corbett, the Sutton. You should be at the studio. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but, uh, you know, we've got to be on our way. We couldn't wait. We've got a show to do, you know, Tom. Why haven't we, Sutton? Yet yeah, lots of children waiting at the Thameside Theatre, Ashton, on the line. Got to get there. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, we're running late, obviously, but Sutton knows about filming. Has he got a couple of minutes for us now? A couple of minutes? Yeah, provided that you pay for the taxi. All right. Well, very quickly, what does Sutton remember most about his Dickie Road shows? Yes, what do you remember, Sutton? Who is that? What do you mean, who is it? Something incredibly famous. Is it Eamon? It's not Eamon, it's Tom O'Connor. He looks all blurred. He looks all right to me. Yeah, all right. I'm sorry about this, Tom. He just doesn't believe it. Put them on, put them on, go on. He wants to... It is Tom O'Connor. Of course it's Tom O'Connor. I told you it wasn't. Take those off. I don't know why you wear them. There's no glass in them anyway. Can you wave to all the boys and girls? Oh, sorry about this, Tom. I'm going to be late. He wants to wave at the camera. Can he wave... Will everybody... Everybody wave back? You know, he, he, he does... He's, he's crying. What's the matter? The film crew aren't waving. Come on, look, you've got to wave, everybody. Come on. That's better. Tell him about Sue. Oh, yes, Sue, so you were asking about Dickinson Road, the very early days. Right. Actually, a very interesting thing... Yes, you, you're going to get it. Go on. A very interesting thing happened. My father used to present the Sooty Show, of course, as you well know. And in those days, there was just Sooty and Sweep, just the two characters. And my father thought he'd like to introduce another character, so he... Uh... Oh, wait, just, just pop down there for a minute. He introduced a little girlfriend called Sue, and he brought this girlfriend along to the, to the studio to introduce her into the show. And the producer came down and he said, I'm sorry, Harry, you can't do that. You can't have a, a, a female puppet in the show. And my father said, why on earth not? And, and the guy said, because it's introducing sex into children's television. And my father was, uh, don't listen to this, go down there. My father was sort of dumbfounded. He said, you must be joking. You know, what, what on earth do you think we're going to do? Anyway, that was the ruling. There was to be no Sue. So in the pub afterwards, because he used to go to the pub, he was bemoaning this, uh, this fact, and a guy came up and said, look, I, I represent a newspaper. Would you mind if I, if I use the story? And my father said, well, it's true, so go ahead. Well, the next day, we got the cuttings, and it said in the tabloids, no sex for sooty. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a big story. I mean, Fleet Street, of course, loved it. And uh, as a consequence of that, the BBC were so sort of ashamed at what they'd done, because there was a hue and a cry about it, that they had to allow Sue to appear. Yeah. But, in fact, there was a directive came down on a piece of headed notepaper from high up, somewhere high up in the BBC, which said, although Sue isn't allowed to appear, Sooty and Sue must never touch. Ah. So that's the way to... It's different now. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't, don't oh. squirt! Don't! Sooty, don't! Get to me! First rule, never work with children or yellow birds. Right, the TV studios. This is it. Well, at least this is where it was. A deconsecrated Methodist church. Not surprising, really, considering the Sutty and Sue scandal. But it was the Dickinson Road, Wesleyan Chapel and Sunday School. The BBC bought it in 1954, but it had been in show business before. Because thousands of cinema goers had seen the inside only heavily disguised. To be able to distinguish a bull from a cow offered a handful of hay. If she comes for it, it's a cow. If he comes for it, run like the very devil. Now, from the cow, we get cow heels, cow slips, and cow cumbers. 
and uh, sometimes we get milk. <laughs> if their tails get frosted, we get ice cream. It had been a film studio, and not only Frank Randall, but many stars had made movies here. Then the telly moved in, and Great Britain saw shows from the Dickinson Road, Wesleyan Chapel. Yes, it's number one. It's Top of the Pops. <laughs> Pop pickers and welcome to Top of the Pops live from Manchester. Way hey, and here is a brand new number one. The up and coming lad live from Liverpool singing My Way, Mr. Tom O'Connor. Howard, <laughs> welcome. Listen, t t tell us what you remember most about your Top of the Pops. Day. Well, first of all, Tom, can I ask, is my secret safe with you? It definitely is. It so, is, yeah. yes. <laughs> oh, Top of the Pops was marvellous. I remember we used to. Those that came from London, we all dashed into planes, all dashed here, got the show done, and when the show was over, we used to uh, hop back into the, the, the taxis, go out to Manchester Airport, where the plane was always kept waiting for us. And we used to drive out to the plane as though we were royalty in big limousines. But it was on this very, very spot, and it was, I always remember it, I, I, I think my greatest humiliation ever. In those days, one year, Sounds Orchestral had just come into the charts with a thing called Cast Your Fate to the Wind. And it was live television, you see. And of course, you know, you get the countdown from the, from the man saying, 10, 9, 8, and you stand there and you're trembling with the microphone. And full of confidence, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I said, they've made the top 10. Here they are, sounds orchestral, and cast your wind to the fate. <laughs> and the place <laughs> fell about. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm looking for a Mr. O'Connor. Oh, yes, you found him. Oh, oh, how oh, wonderful to meet you after all these years. Oh, thank you. Uh, I never miss any one of your programmes, Mr. O'Connor. Would you mind if I call you Des? No, please yourself, but my name's Tom. Is it really, Tom? I, I see Des is just a sort of stage name. Yes. Mr. Worth... We're talking about the Dickinson Road Studios. Yes, I, I, I'm looking for Dickinson Road Studios. I can't find it. Where are? Where is it? Where are they? Well, well they've gone. Gone? Yeah. You can't trust anybody these days. How long have they been gone? About ten years. Well, you think somebody would have noticed? Here we are, Tom. Death. I came up here too. Don't forget, I came up. Yes, he did. He came up here. I came up. I did a show here with Carl Bonny Colahan. Colahan. But Barney Colahan. Barney Colahan. Barney Colahan. Colahan. Yes. Yes. Irish chap. That's him. Well, I came up with him and Hern Burnham and the orchestra. Bernard Herman. Hern Hern Burnham. Herman. Bernard Herman. Yes. And Barney Colahan. He was. And I did a show too. So we all did shows here. Yeah. It was jolly. Jolly. What are you doing? You hold me. I'm just holding you. Giving you. I don't know you were going to fall for a minute. Yes, I'm not too steady. I'll shove off, I think. Where's the yeah. bar? Let's have a look here. We are the Diddy Men. Plumptious diddy men. How tatty felurious. How delightfully discomnockerating to be back here at Dicky Road. And see, look, kids, another diddy man. It's Tommy the Tickler. Hi, kids. <laughs> Ken, Hello, Dickinson Thomas. Road. Happy memories? Very happy memories, Tom. Very happy memories. We did lots of variety shows from here. At the end of the uh, prop list, we used to say, oh, yes, uh, a, a, sun, a, a crown and a cloak and an elephant. We always used to say, and an, just for a gag, we said, an elephant. And this particular week, Barney, Cole and, Barney Colahan said, we've got it. I said, what? He said, the elephant. And we'd, he'd, he'd got an elephant. An ele about that high it was. It was a small elephant. And uh, at the beginning of the show, I said to Joe Gladwin, in the, uh, the start of the show, he used to come up, he was dressed up as a, an Indian. And he said, could you tell me the way to Delhi? I said, well, straight down Oxford Road, turn right at the second lamppost. And then the finale, he was supposed to come back and say, was it the second or the third lamppost? And he came on stage, no elephant. And being a master of ad-lib and repartee, I said to him, where's your elephant? <laughs> 
<laughs> he went, whoa, no, no. The elephant had Stan Parkinson, the floor manager, pinned against the back wall. It seemed the elephant was a lady elephant. It was in season and it fancied Stan. And Stan was pinned against... <laughs> Stan was going, help, help! In the Liverpool home, in the Liverpool home, we speak with an accent exceedingly rare. The thunderous statue exceedingly fair And if you want a cathedral, we've got one to square In the Liverpool home Hey, that was great, that, lads. It was really custy, that. I was made sure. up. Sure. Made up, or what? You can still talk proper, can't you? Only just these like. Years. Listen. Been subverted, no. <laughs> Dickinson Road. Stories of, yeah. of past times. Gosh, we did Dancing yeah. Skylark here. We did our, our first ever telly series here of our very own. And uh, we had a marvellous guest in they built, they built a ship in the studio. And we used to bring in these incredible guests, appropriate guests to a sea programme, like stilt walkers. Oh, yeah. And we had these dog trainers came, these girls with dogs, and we found that they had a dove in a box. And we planned to sing a song called She's Like the Swallow. So, a swallow, you see. So at the end of it, the producer thought it'd be nice. Trevor Hillett, he said, if the dove could fly in and settle on your oh, shoulder. On the shoulder. And the girls said, oh, we, we can cope with that. Training, you know, we, we, they've got these doves trained. Well, we rehearsed it about six times. And every time the dove came in, it sat on my head, it sat in the rigging. It performed natural functions. It did everything but... No, it did not on you. Well, we were waiting for it. Anyway, the thing was, we were terrified. And I was, you know, like that by the end of it. And on cue, on the take, a real ham, in comes the dove. Plump, perfect. Yeah. And a cameraman on that was a young fellow called Barry Bevins. God heavens, yeah. yeah. Did he do it? Wasn't, wasn't very good. No, he's producing this show. He's not doing a lot now. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> fellas, have you got a quick snippet off the top of your heads you can leave us with? Give us well, it's nearly Christmas, isn't it? Oh. How about Christmas, Carol? Yeah. Fine. In E, isn't it? And Ray Allen's just told me that Dickinson Road Studios, Dicky Road, were the warmest, <laughs> friendliest studios in which he ever worked. But it's a cold day today, so I'll give you all a warm glow by unveiling the plaque to commemorate this site. It gives me much pleasure to do so, and I hope it works. Now, 64 years after the North received its first broadcast, the BBC operation is under one roof and back in the city. There have been changes, many over the years, and in 1986, BBC Manchester is about to see yet another one. The head of broadcast here is a chap called Hugh Williams. There's a nice northern name, and he's going to tell us about it. In broadcasting terms, what we've done is bring together local radio, local television, network radio and network television. Before they were managed separately, now they're managed together to give the region a very powerful broadcasting service, more powerful than was possible previously. In territorial terms, what we've done is extend the region to northern and western Cumbria. So we've now got a very strong regional identity and a very strong broadcasting service to go with it. For more than a hundred years, Manchester was the northern capital of England. And although those days may have gone, its cultural and political life is as vigorous as ever. And we want to provide the broadcasting service to match that life. This is about the size of that first tiny studio where broadcasting began in the north 64 years ago. And it fits into a corner of Manchester's Studio 7, the largest sound radio studio in Britain. And the home of the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. We've certainly come a long way from station to ZY. And now, lots of people know that.
Philip Schofield is presenting Children's BBC over on BBC One now. Here on two, we join Richard Whitmore for the National News. And from the newsroom, the main stories. Army bomb disposal experts have made safe an incendiary device found in a department store in Newcastle. The Animal Liberation Front are believed to have planted it. As the bomb disposal squad arrived, police sealed off the city centre street surrounding Bin's store. Hundreds of Christmas shoppers and staff were evacuated, and the bomb disposal squad diffused the incendiary device which was found in the furniture department. Later, a second suspicious package was found, but turned out to be harmless. Police believe the Animal Liberation Front may be responsible. Last Friday, a local radio station received a phone call from someone purporting to be from the organisation, saying that a device would be planted in one of Bin's stores. The experimental aircraft Voyager is on its final approach to Edwards Air Base in California, right on course to set a new record, a non-stop flight around the world. There was a brief scare this morning when a fuel pump failed and Voyager dropped nearly 4,000 feet before the crew were able to restart the engine. Voyager took off nine days ago and is completing her flight a day earlier than expected. Mrs Thatcher is due to arrive back in London soon after spending the day in Northern Ireland visiting police and army bases in Belfast and County Armagh. It was the Prime Minister's first visit to the province since she signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement more than a year ago. She met policemen from Newry, where 47 officers have been killed by terrorists. Unionist MPs have condemned her visit, describing it as deliberate provocation. Dr. Andrei Sakharov and his wife Yelena Bonner are back home in Moscow after nearly seven years in internal exile. And Dr. Sakharov says he'll continue to speak out about human rights issues. He looked sturdy and said his health was better than his wife's. She followed behind the throng, looking frail and ill, and told friends helping her that she might need another operation in the West within a year. The almost total isolation had been the worst of the exile, according to Dr. Sakharov, an isolation broken abruptly by a telephone call from Mr. Gorbachev, saying, you and Bonner can go back to Moscow. Next news is on BBC One at six o'clock with Nicholas Witchell and Andrew Harvey. Good afternoon to you. Well, there's milder weather on the way for Christmas. In fact, I think before the night's out, milder weather with rain and some sleet or snow for a time in places will have got into Scotland and Northern Ireland. A few fog patches further south just for a time. A touch of frost in the more central and eastern parts as well. Tomorrow, that rain pushing on, so quite a wet day over Scotland and Northern Ireland. But England and Wales starting off dry and in many places fairly bright. But the rain working its way southeast was during the course of the day, although not actually probably getting to the extreme southeast until pretty late on. Some brighter weather to follow along behind, and a milder day in many northern and western parts, but still fairly cold in the southeast. That's all for now. Now, the southeast news from Caroline Wrighton. Good afternoon. British Rail has warned that the vandals who pushed a stolen car onto a railway line in Hampshire could have caused a disaster. The train driver and his guard had a miraculous escape after their train ploughed into the vehicle. Stuart Meister reports. Police say the stolen Ford Cortina must have been driven along the platform at Winchfield and onto the track. It was hit just after 5 o'clock this morning, luckily by a four-coach staff train with no passengers. The car was jammed beneath the locomotive wheels and shunted 150 yards down the track, but neither the train driver nor the guard were hurt. The line is a busy commuter route to London, and the incident caused rush hour chaos this morning. BR have condemned those responsible. If the car had been hit two hours later, it would have been a commuter train that was wrecked, and it could have been a major disaster. A man from Peckham who was stabbed repeatedly when he went to the aid of a pensioner being mugged has been talking about his ordeal. It was the second time that Colm McAvoy had tried to prevent an attack and been injured, but he says he'd do it all again. I don't tell myself as being brave because... It's, I know it sounds silly to say that I, wouldn't, I, I haven't done what nobody else would have done because a lot of people wouldn't do it because they're frightened. I think that's the thing, it's about time people stop letting all of these, these scum walk all over people, you know? Because if people are prepared to stand up and fight for what they want, I don't mean physically fight, but get out and do something about it, you know? 
A Dutch cargo ship, which was at the centre of a rescue operation in the English Channel, is now safely anchored off Dover. A cross-channel ferry and the Dover lifeboat both raced to its aid when its cargo of steel broke loose. Chris Myhill, the part-time footballer from Henley in Berkshire, who was injured in an explosion last night, has died in hospital. He was badly burned when a car he was working on at the Gallo Street Common Garage burst into flames. Plans for a huge man-made island off South End have been resurrected by the local council. The plans for a 2,000 berth marina, luxury homes and a five-star hotel had been shelved by councillors, but now the policy committee is recommending the scheme goes ahead. Luton Town football fans will receive mince pies and a glass of champagne if they go to the team's game against Watford on Boxing Day. Club chairman David Evans says it's part of his campaign to clean up football. Well, that's all for now. Join us for more South East News in London Plus at 6.35 on BBC One. But now the weather for the region with Bill Giles. Actually, it's Michael Fish, but not to worry about that. The weather is on the change, actually. There is some milder weather on the way. Not tonight, though. Still one or two sleety showers around at the moment. But skies are beginning to clear now, so it will end up for a fairly cold night where the cloud clears sufficiently. There will be some frost around, some icy patches on the roads, and even possibly a patch or two of fog. Tomorrow, the mist clearing away. Quite a bright day for the most part. A little bit of sunshine, but clouding over all the time. And I think come the lat latter part of the day, you'll have some rain spreading across from the west. Now on to today's film, starring Anna Eagle in an unusual role for her as a Nazi sympathiser involved in a daring German plot in Yellow Canary.